in conscience, let's stand up together. Wherever you're coming from today, whether here or online, we all join in humbling ourselves at the feet of our King, Jesus Christ, knowing our lives are held together by his power, all creation held together by his word. Let's sing these words together in praise and thanksgiving today. Come on. When all I see is the battle, you see my victory. When all I see is a mountain, you see a mountain moved. And as I walk through the shadows, your love surrounds me. There's nothing to fear now, for I am safe with you. Every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Oh. And if you are for me, who can be against me? Jesus, there's nothing impossible for you. When I see all the ashes, you see the beauty. When all I see is the cross, God, you see the empty tomb. to him every fear we lay at his feet this morning knowing that he is a good God a great father one who has shown us his loving kindness in Jesus Christ one of the things I love so much about gathering week in week out with our church is this 
that as we sing together, as we hear God's word taught, even if they're things we've heard before, it's a reminder to me, it's a reminder to us of things that I too quickly move on from, too often move past and forget and think, oh, I know that already, I'm, I'm good, and by Monday morning, it's long gone in my mind. And so coming week after week is a reminder to me of that which is important, which matters, which glorifies God. And, and the song we're about to sing, it, it does this and it helps me in this. And the bridge says, I am blessed, I am called, I am healed, I am whole. I am saved in Jesus' name. Highly favored, anointed, and filled with your power, God, for the glory of Jesus' name. Those are powerful words. Ones we can carry with us, not just this morning, but day after day as we go through the week. So let's sing this song together. And as we do so, just tuck these words in the back of your mind that when you wake up tomorrow morning, you would think, I am blessed, I am called as an ambassador of God's glory, as a priest in his kingdom, as one who has been saved by grace. Let's keep singing. Amazing love, thou welcomes me, the kindness of mercy. Thou bought with blood, Wholeheartedly, my soul on this God, you're so good. God, you're so good. God, you're so good. You're so.
deserve the sacrifice of your son. And yet, in your mercy and in your grace, you made a way. We thank you and praise you every minute and every hour, God. To you be the glory. Amen. You can take your seats. Hey everyone, welcome to Constance. We're so glad you're spending part of your day with us and we'd love to know you're participating. The best way you can do that is to take out your phone, head to constancefree.org links and fill out our connection card. There's also a place where you can include your prayer requests this week. Each week, our staff gathers to pray over what's going on in your life and we'd love to hear what you are thanking God for too. So make sure to fill out your connection card this week and let us know. Also, if you're newer to Constance, this is a great way to make an easy connection with someone here. Just check the box that says, I'm new, and we have a team of people who would love to welcome you and find ways to help you connect here in the weeks ahead. I also know, uh, wanna let you know about baptism. This is one of our favorite celebrations. So if you've made the decision to follow Jesus and haven't been baptized, I encourage you to take this next step of your faith and register for our baptism happening on August 15th. If you're interested in getting baptized, there's a required meeting tomorrow, July 19th at 6.30 p.m. So be sure to check out constancefreeze.org slash links and sign up for that. And something you may not know about is our block party trailer and new neighborhood gathering invitations. We know neighborhoods are better when neighbors gather together. So we've put together resources for you to make an impact in your neighborhood by getting people to come together, whether it's for a short casual gathering or an all out party. Check out our family resource center on campus for things like door hanger invites and block party info packets, or go online this week to constancefree.org slash links and reserve our block party trailer, complete with bouncy houses, games, and a speaker system designed to make throwing your summer party even easier. Now, let's dive into the message as we continue our series, Defining Moments. Good morning, everyone. Yes, defining moments. And as I was thinking about defining moments, I was just reminded that there's, there's three kinds of defining moments that we have. We have common ones, we have uncommon ones, and we have rare ones. Rare defining moments are the defining moments that we have in our lives that we had nothing to do with. In other words, we didn't want it, we didn't ask for it, but here it is. But those are the defining moments that we have. An example, uh, if you got hit by a car on the way home and were involved in a serious car accident, no one chooses that, but boy, can that be a defining moment. Or if you get sick with a disease that's a killer disease, that's a defining moment for us. We didn't choose it, but those are rare because as I look back over my life, the decisions that, that I have um, are, and I've made, the defining moments, so many of those are things that I was involved with the process. So we have the rare ones that nobody decided. We have the uncommon ones. And the uncommon defining moments are things that we did once. We got married, we signed a document, we bought a house. But even those things, while those are uncommon, we have less of those, I want to lean into the third kind of defining moment that we have, that is the decisions we make day after day after day after day. And even a marriage, while it was a one-time event where we made a decision and, and signed up on the dotted line, the marriage is impacted by the things we do day after day after day. It's a thousand things. And likewise, as we come and start talking about the spiritual dimension of our lives, it is, of course, incredibly important that we make that one-time decision for Christ, where we acknowledge that we've sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and we need his forgiveness, and we come to Christ, and we receive him as our Savior. But what it is to be a follower of Christ is not just a decision. It is a decision that I make over and over and over and over again to be a follower of him. We're going to talk about that today specifically from the life of Peter. 
And in one sense, my message today is a continuation of Pastor Son's message from last week in Matthew chapter 16. If I could give you just a little bit of a reminder of what went on, Jesus had gathered his disciples together and was looking for a little bit of a status report on his ministry. And he came to them and said, guys, who are people saying that I am? And they said, well, some people are saying that you're John the Baptist, come back to life. Some of you are saying you're Elijah, the Old Testament person reincarnated somehow here. Some say you're Jeremiah, and others said you're the prophets. And then Jesus came with this very specific question in Matthew 16, I believe it's verse 15. What about you? Who do you say that I am? And Peter gave this response. Simon Peter said, verse 16, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. I think most of us have a hard time understanding what a huge statement that was. Because every Jewish boy grew up in a Jewish family where from when they were an infant... Dad and mom would point them towards this blessed hope, this blessed promise for every Jew that someday our Messiah is going to come. And it's not the power of looking back to remember Uncle Fred or George Washington. It's not the power of looking back. Here, it's the power of looking ahead to that one day there's going to be a Messiah. He's going to rule and reign. He's going to get rid of Rome. We're going to have the power. We're going to have the prestige. We're going to have the prosperity that we deserve because after all, we're supposed to be blessed, right? And I think when Peter made this statement, the rest of the guys had this holy hush moment. That re- the rest of the disciples were saying, please say yes. For generations, my family has longed for this day. And it sure sounds like, and it sure looks like, you're the one. Please say yes. And Jesus responded, and he said, yes, that's me. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And I can only imagine the guys going, yes! That's what we wanted to hear. What a great day. We finally heard the news. And then this astounding verse, verse 20, where Jesus comes and says, don't tell anyone. Isn't that totally counterintuitive? What do you mean, don't tell anyone? Really, the first 15 and a half chapters of the book of Matthew has been leading to the point of please understand that I am the Messiah. And now that we've come and we finally get it that you're the Messiah, you're going to come and tell us not to tell anybody? And as we will see, yes, because they did not understand what it meant to have a Messiah because they were thinking of an earthly king and an earthly kingdom and Jesus was talking about a heavenly king and a heavenly kingdom and that his power was greater and while they were thinking about power and prosperity and politics Jesus was talking about an organization that the gates of hell could not resist and while they were having common conversations Jesus was having a higher conversation So don't tell anybody because you're not ready to tell anybody yet. And verse 21, the story continues. 
And from that time on, and for those of you that, that study the Gospel of Matthew, you know that this verse is the watershed moment where the entire Gospel of Matthew has come to this point, and from this point on, the entire Gospel of Matthew is coming to the cross and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must. And before we go on, notice that he does not say, guys, I just need to give you a word of warning. Once in a while, we might run into some challenges. So we're going to have to be diligent and stay on our game because there's going to be distractions and there's going to be some opposition to this. No. He must go to Jerusalem he must suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law. And he must be killed. And on the third day, be raised to life. My guess is none of the disciples heard that last part because raising someone back to life just didn't make sense. They understood suffering, they understood dying, but they didn't understand coming back to life. And for all the disciples, they just had to have this brain freeze moment of what are you talking about? You're telling me that the sky is pink and the grass is purple. This doesn't compute to all my understandings of what it is to have a king and a kingdom. So much so that Peter spoke up. And Peter took Jesus aside, is what the scripture says. He took him aside. Now, I think what this was, was this kind of the picture where you'd take someone by the arm, away from the rest of the group, and kind of speak into their ear. So Peter took him to the side, and he began to rebuke him. Rebuke is a strong word. It's the same word used when Jesus spoke to the wind and the waves and rebuked them and said, Stop it! I can't think of anything more forceful. Never, Lord! Stop talking this way. This is not going to happen to you. This shall never happen. This will not be. You don't understand, Jesus, what it is to be a Messiah. We have a clear idea. And the Messiah needs to rule and reign and bring prosperity and power. That's what it's about. Never stop it. I hope you caught this sense that this was an intense moment. Because <laughs> I can tell some of you are going, whoa. And Jesus responded. He turned. Remember we had Peter on the side talking to Jesus? Some people think it was so forceful that Jesus actually turned his back to him when he said, get behind me. I personally think that Jesus turned to look him right in the eye. And he said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. It was a stronger rebuke than Peter's rebuke. Get thee behind me. There's really three layers to this, and all of these come back to what Jesus had just had this encounter with Peter, talking about the church and conquering and going against the gates of hell. And first of all, he says, Peter, you're acting like a Satan. Satan in Old Testament language, uh, Satan could all, would not only be the evil one, but it could be any adversary. So I have an adversary coming against me. And Peter, remember how a couple of verses ago I said you're going to bind things on earth and they're going to be bound in heaven and you're going to loose and they're going to be loose and you're going to be an asset to all of this and this is important. Peter, not right now when you talk this way. Instead of being an asset, you've become my adversary. Get behind me. Learn what it is to follow. You are not in charge. You're acting like a stumbling block. Remember, Peter, when I just said that your name is Peter, which means a rock, and on this rock I'm going to build my church, and a rock can be a, a building stone? You know what else a rock can be? It can be something that someone trips over. And that's what you've become in the meaning of the word here. You become a stumbling rock to me. 
And notice that you're not just being a stumbling block to the rest of the disciples or to little children and a millstone hung around your neck. You're a stumbling block to me. I don't want to hear this kind of talk because it's wrong. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Remember when he just said, blessed are you, Simon Peter, for God, for humans did not reveal this to you, but God did. You're not thinking about God right now. You're thinking about your concerns. And Peter, if you're going to talk about a Messiah, and you're going to understand that I'm a Messiah, you're going to understand the path that I have to walk on, and that any person who's going to come after me and be a follower of me, you're going to have to do the same. And in verse 24, Jesus gives this crystal clear description of what it is to follow him. Verse 24, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny himself, take up their cross, and follow me. Notice again, whoever wants to be my disciple must. Because I think a lot of us look at a verse like this and say, well, that's true if you want to be a missionary. Or you pastors, I sure hope you're doing that kind of thing. But it, this is not optional. It, this is what Jesus is saying. I'm not making this up. Jesus tells us how to follow him and what it means to be on a path that focuses on him and brings him glory instead of focusing on ourselves and what we want out of life. And I spent some time over the last few weeks just thinking about just trying to contrast what Jesus said to the kind of paths that we think about and that, that, that sound appealing to us. And it's the path of discipleship and there's a Jesus path and then there's a not Jesus path. And the Jesus path is crystal clear because first of all, under the Jesus path, we're to de deny ourselves. And this is not a one-time decision. This is a decision that's made over and over and over and over. I can't tell you how many times I've had to decide, no, yes. We deny ourselves. And I, I've thought a lot about what the right word is here for the opposite. And I don't know whether it's elevate, selfie, focus on, obsess with. Right now, I'm kind of leaning towards defined by. Because we have this huge voice in our culture. And you've heard it if you've had discerning ears that says, you know how to find meaning and purpose in life? You're going to discover that in you. You know where a good place to start might be? Ancestry.com. Because if you can find out that you're Swedish instead of, of Norwegian, it's going to be a life-changing moment for you. Because how can you truly understand who you are until you understand who you are? And you need to spend more time just getting to know yourself. And whatever your heart leads you to feel, you just need to embrace that and go for that. And if you're not happy, the only happiness you're going to find is on the inside of you. And if you could just express fully who you are, then you're going to have this eureka moment and nirvana is going to come into your existence and there's going to be peace and flowers and beautiful music all the way around you for the rest of your life. <laughs> and I'm making a little bit fun, but let me tell you, that thinking is so entrenched in our culture today. It's a much bigger problem than any other problem you want to talk about today. The biggest problem is not Republicans or Democrats. The biggest problem is that we're obsessed with ourselves. 
And we think that our identity can be found in here, where God's word says what's going on in here is not a reliable guide, but instead we can find our identity in who God is and what he's done for us. And the more we obsess with him and focus on him and deny ourselves, the greater joy and peace and contentment we're going to have. But it's a totally different message than what our society says. But if you want to be a follower of Jesus, a disciple, it begins with saying, no, I'm not going to focus on me. I'm going to focus on God. And as I do, he's going to give me a peace that passes all understanding and a purpose, and a joy, and a power, and contentment that's found in him, and in him alone. So it's not denying as if I'm going to give up everything. I'm giving up that which is worthless to gain that which is priceless. The path of self-elevating and obsessing is like giving salt water to a thirsty man. No matter how much you drink, you're still going to be thirsty. And just worse off than you were before. So I've been thinking, what does it look like for you and for me to deny ourselves? Remember, it's a decision we make over and over and over again. It says that God's ways are higher than my ways. His understanding is greater than mine. It means that There's going to be this pressure from the world and pressure around me to fill my life with other things. And I'm going to need to be very intentional in my decision making to make sure that I say no to enough things so that I can say yes to God. Don't you experience that every Sunday morning? Where out of the list of things you could do, a decision to come and learn about God and to fellowship with brothers and sisters, to worship him in corporate worship. It's a decision that we make. And if we don't make that decision on a regular basis, you know what? We won't see at church anymore. We deny ourselves. We find good and profitable uses of our times and energy. And instead of finding one more activity to do on one more night of the week, one more series to catch up with on Netflix or Amazon, instead we come and we find a small group of people to come together and study God's word together because I'm going to say no to all the things that would be natural so I can say yes to that which is best. And when I find $250,000 in my pocket, I'm not going to look for an opportunity to buy a ticket so I can go to outer space. And I can't justify doing that when I know that there are people in Anoka County who go to bed every night hungry. And I can't spend that on me when I can spend something that's even better. If anyone would come after me, let them Deny themselves. Let them, second of all, take up their cross. Take up their cross as opposed to taking up comfort. Uh, Guys, we're missing one here. And if not, just make it up as we go. Take up your cross versus take up your comfort. That's what the next part of the verse says. Let us take up our cross. Now again, no one wants to take up their cross. Not even Jesus wanted to. You remember the night before that he hung on the cross? He was in the Garden of Gethsemane pleading with the Father, if there be any other way, let's go there. But if not, thy will be done. And Jesus went to the cross, as it says in Hebrews, for the joy set before him, scorning at shame, because he knew that when you go through the path of dying, there is a living that takes place that could never happen without a willingness to die. Take up your cross. 
as the years have gone by, I've just seen more and more that in our lives there, there is a, there's an aspect of our, uh, of our Christianity that every step of it requires a little bit of dying. That if I'm going to have consistent daily devotions, I'm going to have to die a little bit. Die to what I think and what I want and to the discipline and obedience to find time to do so. I need to take up my cross. I need to be willing to make a sacrifice, to pay a price. I think of that when it comes to a topic like forgiveness. I've got news for you. Nobody wants to forgive anybody. It's not, oh good, I get to do this again. And forgiving someone requires a little bit of dying But for anyone who's done that, you know that in that process of dying, you find a life that's better and more abundant when we follow the paths of Christ. So we say no to ourselves and we die so that we can live and say yes to Christ. To be honest, I think about it every time we have a baptismal service. For in the act of a person being baptized, we say that that person is identifying with Christ in their death so that they might identify with Christ in his resurrection life and power. And it just lets us know that there is a power in identifying with his death that gives us a greater power than we can have on our own. By the way, Did you hear the announcement that there's a baptismal service coming up? And that tomorrow night there's a mandatory meeting for that. And I'm just trying to understand why you wouldn't be baptized. I don't like being in public. I don't like getting wet. We could come up with a long list. I just believe there's great power in identifying with death. And understanding that the path of Jesus identifies with death so we can identify with what it really means to live. Last but not least, if anyone would come after me, they must deny himself, take up their cross, and follow Christ. I think the opposite of that is having Christ follow you. Isn't that what Peter was saying? Jesus, you have this all wrong. Let me tell you how it's supposed to be. I think there's lots of times we do that. I still remember a conversation with a woman some 20 years ago where she was just mad at God because they had listed their house for sale and their house hadn't sold and she wanted to sell their house so they could buy a bigger and better one. And her dream was dependent on selling that house. And what is God doing wrong to not give her what she wants? And yet how many of us think of Christ in the same way, that he's somehow our, our, uh, he's our golden ticket. He's our pass that when we go to Disneyland, that we go to the front of the line. Go to the front of the line. Jesus is just going to take care of you. You just go to the front of the line. And we make Jesus as one who's supposed to serve us instead of us understanding that we are to serve him. If anyone would come after me, they must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow him. The next couple of verses continue on, and really what Jesus is saying is, let me explain this to you. It's about winning and losing, because we all want to win. We all want to win at the game of life. We want the best that's out there. We want the, the brass ring. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul, or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? And I think what Jesus is saying is, we all want to live, but this winning in life can be kind of deceptive, because there is a path in life that looks like winning, but it's losing. I tried to think of different examples for this. Uh, To be honest, I thought of Lance Armstrong. Years ago, won the Tour de France a number of years in a row. 
did it on, on drugs, did it on steroids. So he was disqualified. And a guy who thought he was winning was actually in the process of losing everything, losing his very soul. I, I thought of the example that recently happened in China uh, before COVID. There was a marathon. And in that marathon, the first two people missed the last turn. And the third place guy ran and won the marathon because he went to the finish line. And how many of us are going to the wrong finish line? Great story. But the more I thought about it, the best example I could come up with was one that Jesus used. Duh. He tells the story in Luke chapter 12. And allow me just to remind you. Luke chapter 12. He told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded buka harvest. It was a winning, winning day. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I got more money than I know what to do with. I'm going to go to outer space. No, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I have no place to store my crops. So this is what I'll do. I'm going to tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store up my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. And who of us, when we look at us, isn't our response is winning. I, I mean, what more could you ask for from life than to get to the point where you can retire well and eat, drink, and be merry? That is the American dream. That is winning. But remember, winning can be deceptive because even when a guy thinks he might be winning, he might be losing. And Jesus points that out when God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? You see, even when you think you might be winning, you might be losing and I can't tell you how many times I've had conversations with people who've lived their lives for themselves, been self-absorbed, self-consumed, just sought everything for themselves. And they've left a path of destruction in broken relationships, everything along their way because they chose the path that was not Jesus instead of the path that was Jesus. Jesus comes back to this big question when we come back to Matthew chapter 16. I think it's verse 27. For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. So Jesus is giving this big picture again. You guys are obsessed with what's going on right now. You guys are thinking about Rome and how you can get rid of them. You guys are thinking of power and prosperity and all the things that you think of the good life. Let me tell you about the big picture. And I want to invite you again to be a part of something that's bigger than yourself. But to be in part of something that's bigger than yourself, you're going to have to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow after me. And when you do, when you actually get to the finish line of life, you will hear the words of the King of kings and Lord of lords and say, well done. And I remember a defining moment in my own life. It was a defining moment when I was a young man, and I'm not even sure where this came from. I think I won it by quoting some Bible verses at church, but I ended up getting a plaque. And that plaque hung on my wall. And every night, the last thing that I saw before I went to sleep, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. I have revisited that defining moment at least a thousand times. And I'm sure I'll need to do it again several hundred in the days that I have left. Because the path of humanity is so tempting. It's what every advertisement tells us about. 
We just can't escape those voices in our culture. But I, first of all, want to be a follower of Christ. I want to be his disciple. And I want to be a part of a kingdom that's bigger than my garage. Bigger than my obituary. But one that has to do with pounding on the gates of hell and plundering it. And I pray that today would be a day when you decide once again to follow the path of Christ. Let's pray. Lord, I'm so human. And I get caught in, into the voices around me in the world. And it is so tempting to think that winning is about gaining the most toys. And I thank you for your word, and I proclaim once again that your word is true and that the path to winning is, is found in losing what I want so that I might gain the best of you. And Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters here today that as we turn our eyes towards you and look full in your wonderful face, that the things of earth would grow strangely dim in the light of your glory and your grace. So on this day, Lord, we look to you. Help us to be obsessed with things that matter for all eternity to the glory of your name. Amen. Thanks, Randy. Let's stand together and respond. Christ is my reward and all my devotion. Now there's nothing in this world that could ever satisfy. Through every trial, my soul will sing, no turning back. I've been set free Christ is enough for me Christ is enough for me Everything I need is in you Everything I need Christ my no matter the cost for the sake of his glory and our joy with him 
now and forevermore. It's been a joy to worship and gather with you today, church. Just a reminder, if you are following Jesus and you haven't been baptized, we would encourage you, take that step. We have a class going on tomorrow night here in this building. Check it out, constancefree.org forward slash links to learn more about that class and how you can be baptized in following Jesus. Well, Lord, bless and keep you this week. We'll see you back here next Sunday.